Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for this opportunity to come before you in worship, in song, before your word. Help us not to take it for granted. Help us to see it for what it is, your revelation that you have given to us. Sinful people who are so undeserving of anything but death, but yet you in, in your love and your mercy and your grace gave us Christ. Lord, I pray as we reflect on your glory and your majesty this morning, help us to see how profound your love is with respect to that and what Christ did on the cross for us. I pray that you would shepherd our hearts this morning. May your spirit be working in us to remove distractions, um, thoughts that would take away from what you would have for us this morning. Pray that you would allow for me not to be a distraction, but to speak truth and accuracy as you have revealed it to us. And we pray your blessing upon this time that we have around your word. May we learn and grow and, and um, develop um, into uh, better followers and disciples of you as we learn to love you more. May we bow our knee now this morning. In Christ's name, amen. In 2018, it had been estimated that 3.6 billion people watched the FIFA World Cup. This, of course, surpassed the 2020 World Olympics that took place, where 2 billion viewers watched this world event. Two weeks ago, the 2022 World Cup kicked off, and audits have already come in showing that this sporting event was bringing in more than 5 billion viewers around the world. This past Thursday, all eyes were on two particular matches, Spain versus Japan and Germany versus Costa Rica. And Germany desperately needed a win to continue on in the World Cup, but they also needed Spain to either tie with Japan or for, or for Spain to win altogether to allow them to advance past Japan. Unfortunately for, for Germany, though, Japan won their match against Spain 2-1. to one. And our condolences are with son, or to, to Laura, who is cheering on, but also to Spain. But at any rate, when you watch that game, something occurred to where Japan scored their second goal. It, it went under official review since it appeared that the ball was kicked from an out-of-bounds position into the net. And from several different camera angles, it, it certainly appeared to be the case. But in fact, the ball did not cross the line altogether. The, te the technology they have and the, and the above camera angle allowed the referee to feel like he had sufficient evidence to, uh, to allow the goal to count. Soccer fans, of course, around the world are still raging about this on social media. They're not happy that this, this ball, which appears from multiple different angles, looked like it was clearly out of bounds. What makes this so controversial was that there were so many cameras catching all this. So of course, it, it looked like this was not in bounds, and the goal should not have counted, and Germany should have been able to advance in the World Cup, and their dreams and their hopes were dashed. The problem is, they, what really happened was that the ball was still touching the line to some degree, and viewers, um, in order to make a, a clear determination of what really happened, you have to have some concept of spatial geometry and how lines work and angles and perspectives. But of course, the technology they have that's imp imp implemented within the ball allows for them to, to make that call confidently. This kind of perspective that you need to have, to have the right perspective to make that judgment call, is, is something that we find ourselves applying to our lives and how we perceive certain circumstances or world events that are ongoing. In Revelation 4, John's vision of the throne room of, of God brings our focus off of ourselves and reorients our perspective and how we process reality. 
If you recall from Revelation 2 and 3, John just concluded giving an account of Jesus' admonishment to the seven churches, right? John has, has gone from conveying the, the church's individual needs, their individual weaknesses, their individual strengths, their individual sins, to finding himself in heaven. He goes from issues going on to, on earth to something that is going on beyond the earth, issues we see as, as significant um, from day to day, on a day-to-day -day basis, to issues in heaven that we can't fully comprehend, but that we must comprehend to some degree in faith if we're going to survive the struggles of hardship and temptation in this life. So by changing perspectives, John moves, uh, or John does something here that is very important for us to see. He is saying, as, as, as we're living our lives and enduring the pain, the suffering, wrestling with compromise and, or temptations, he's, he, it's as if he's saying, I want you to know something. I need you to know that there is a realm beyond this every day, which is beyond what you see here, and everything is being worked out or allowed in accordance to God's will from, the, from a heavenly perspective and realm. And that is... From the, from the God of the universe, the King of kings and Lord of lords, as he's reigning and ruling in perfect majesty. So what does John see here exactly? Well, we had just read Revelation 4, but let's read the first six verses at least. And as you read these, I, try to read it with a fresh look, maybe. Um, sit back and, and, and try to imagine what it must have been like with John here as he's, as he's uh, recounting the struggles and the pains and the, the issues going on in these churches to all of a sudden being transported into the presence of God. Let's read the first, couple, the first few verses here. After these things, I looked and behold a door standing open in heaven and the first voice which I heard sound, or like the sounds of a trumpet speaking with me said, come up here, and I will show you what must take place after these things. And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was standing in heaven, and one sitting on the throne. And he who was sitting was like a jasper stone, and a sardius in appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne, like an emerald in appearance. Around the throne were 24 thrones, and upon the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting, clothed in white garments and golden crowns on their heads. Out from the throne came flashes of lightning and the sounds of pearls of thunder. And there were seven lamps of burning fire before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was something like a great sea of glass, like crystal. So what does John see here? He sees the setting for a drama that's about to unfold in chapter 5. He sees the centrality and the majesty of an indescribable God who is reigning and, and ruling in the heavens. That's what he sees here. And I believe the, the central takeaway from this passage that I want to try to drive home this morning is, is, um, is this, the that God's majestic glory demands everlasting worship, a reality that ought to change our perspective and ultimately to change the way we live. So let me, put, let me put it this way. As it's noted on your outlines there, right worship of our majestic God demands a change of perspective. Right worship of our majestic God demands a change of perspective. And what we're going to see here from this text is, is four reasons why right worship demands a changed perspective. But we will, we will only address the first two this morning, and next week we'll look at the, the following two, the last two, from verses 6 through 11. But before we jump into this passage, a couple things to keep in mind as we read and understand um, this kind of literature. Um, we know that it often, Revelation will often have uh, symbolism, it will often have um, non-linear um, events, and, and it's, it's highly non-linear, and it's, and it's not good to take symbolism and tie it together and try to put it in a chronological order. 
apocalyptic literature is, is often um, um, characterized by that. And you can certainly see that in Hebrew apocalyptic literature uh, throughout, um, especially in the intertestamental period. If you read any of that going on, it's, it's quite interesting. Um, something else to keep in mind is the, the language limitations, the vocabulary of, and the limitations we have there. Just, just a couple months ago, or actually just, yeah, a couple months ago, Ariel and I visited the island of Guam in the South Pacific. And Guam, of course, is modernized and up to date for the most part. But there's, there's neighboring islands, not so much. If, if you were to island hop over to some of the, the Mariana Islands or take a short flight over to Papua New Guinea, um, it would be, it, you would find difficulty communing, communicating with, with some of the, maybe the remote villages and tribes in, in, with up to date vocabulary that expresses or explains advanced technologies um, of the 21st century. Many of these ancient languages and people groups do not have the capacity to comprehend modern advances simply because of their limited, outdated vocabulary. Um, and, and imagine for yourself, you're traveling to one of these islands and, and you spend about four years really learning and immersing yourself in the language and becoming affluent in the primitive language that you're, that you're studying. And your assignment is to go back to this tribe without using any objects and try to explain to them how electricity works. What would you say? You, could, you would come to the village, no doubt, and, and greet the, the elders or the chief, and, and you would say, I'd like to talk to you about electricity. And of course, you have to coin that word for them. They don't have it in their primitive language. And you go on to say, electricity perhaps is like, it's like a spirit that travels along vines. But these vines aren't from trees or, or wooded vines. They're, they're vines that you have to, you make from hard material, and they're man-made, and they're, uh, they're produced, they're made in, in large mud huts called factories, right? And they're, they're looped from, from tree to tree, but they're not actually trees. You have to cut them down. They're called timber, and, and, and you probably lose them from there. But then, then you have to try to explain how this spirit-like force slash electricity gets there. And you're like, well, maybe it's, you try to explain it in, in a sense that it's pumped through one end, and it travels really fast all the way to your mud hut where it enters your, your room. And, and there we have another little thing that we make. And... Um, and it captures this, this force and it creates light and heat and, um, and, and without, without smoke. And so your, your little room and your hut can be lit by this. And, and you can imagine the bewilderment on their faces as they're trying to comprehend this idea and this concept. Um, but what, you, know, you might ask, what's, what's wrong with these people? Why can't they understand? Well, they're being asked to understand something with which they have no experience of. What ends up happening is, is much of your description, much of the words you use, are, are, gonna, are going to contain similes and metaphors and, and uh, symbolism. So how else does John describe the throne room of God? In 1 Corinthians, or sorry, 2 Corinthians, Paul is, is, is brought up into the third heaven, and he uses vague language to communicate his experience. And he even says these things that cannot be uttered whether he was forbidden to utter them or he just didn't have the, the ability to, to communicate what he exactly saw, perhaps. Apocalyptic literature is, is the perfect genre for communicating the reality of God in the transcendent realm in which he resides in heaven. Even though we have no experience of it, God in his mercy has provided this genre to help us understand and to try to grasp some insight into what this is like, what it is who God is like. So let's look at verse 1 as we're going to talk about this. After these things, I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I had heard, like the sound of a trumpet speaking with me, said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after these things. This first voice can clearly be identified as the risen Lord Jesus Christ. And, and of 
John met this voice, he, he heard this voice back in chapter 1, 12 through 16. Certainly, you can attest to the fact that this was Christ speaking to him. He says, I will show you what must take place after this, whether this is a point of history or, or after this point in, in John's sequence of, of a vision. You can't necessarily tell unless you read the larger context. And I think, I think it's safe to assume that after this here, he's talking about maybe the sequence of, of, his, of his visions that's taking place. And, and some people have seen this passage here as, as really symbol-laden, just a lot of symbolism going on. And, um, and they're identifying John perhaps as a representative of, of, of the church and of the rapture and John going up to heaven, et cetera, et cetera. And um, anyone reading apocalyptic literature at that time would, would obviously not take it that way. It's, it's very common to have someone in apocalyptic literature being ushered up or taken up into a higher realm or in heaven and they're, and they're showed something, they're revealed something. And so that's, that's not uncommon for this to, to occur. So we should not take it any more than, than what it is, John in the spirit, in, in uh, viewing what is, what is taking place in the throne room of God. John replies here in verse 2, immediately he says, I was in the spirit and behold a throne was standing in heaven and one sitting on the throne. And he who was sitting in like was like a jasper stone and a sardius in appearance, and there was a rainbow around the throne, like an emerald in appearance. Around the throne was 24 thrones. Upon those thrones, 24 elders. John sees the centrality and really the majesty of God here that, that drives his view of worship of God. And, and, and is John simply wanting to impress us with the... the the incredible you know, majesty of God's throne room? I would, you know, yes, but I think it's more as well. I think there's, there's further implications to be had from this. I think John sees the throne and something, and, and what is sitting on it to help us understand that there is a God who is reigning and ruling in the heavens on a higher throne than all other thrones. So yeah, we're, we're standing in awe of this, but this also impacts us in many other ways as well as we consider what John is seeing here. God is on the throne, and, and therefore, right worship sees God actively enthroned. God is actively enthroned. That's, that's our first point here, um, and the first reason why right worship um, demands a change of perspective. God is actively enthroned. In context here, the first century believers were undergoing extreme pressure. I think we saw some of that from chapter 2 and, ver and chapter 3. Um, and, and this pressure came from Caesar and, and the, the Caesar cult that worshipped the emperor. Um, if, if uh, they even thought of these Christians as atheists because they believed in one God and, and God was spirit and, and, and they didn't believe in, in multiple gods. And so the, the, the Roman Empire, the Greeks, they thought of them as atheists. They didn't really believe. And in fact, they, they were uh, in opposition to, they were a threat to the, the throne. They were in threat to the emperor. So there was a lot of persecution taking place at this time. They also experienced pressure from their occupations in, as, as um, they participate um, in what, what, what is called uh, guilds, trade guilds. As they're working their jobs, you have to, if you want to make a good living, uh, you need to be a part of this association, this, this guild that allows you to network and, and trade with merchants and craftsmen and artists. But of course, if you're not worshiping Caesar, if you're not falling in line with the emperor, you're, you're ousted, you're, you're, um, you're uh, persecuted. Also, the power and influence um, of really the emperor affect every aspect of their lives in many different ways. You could also consider the pressure of false teaching from groups like the Nicolaitans or the, the immorality that um, was promoted by the, the promiscuous, seductive woman of, of Jezebel in Thyatira. So there's a lot of pressure, a lot of issues that they're having to endure and navigate in first century Palestine. 
and, and throughout the Roman Empire. They, they needed to recognize that God is on the throne, not, not was, not passively on the throne, but he's active on the throne. He's, he's working, he's reigning on the throne. He's sitting on his throne. That's what this idea of sitting is conveying, this active idea of ruling and reigning. Psalm 47, 8 says, God reigns over the nations. God sits on his holy throne. In order for us to have a, a rightly ordered perspective of worship, we must recognize God is the one who is actively enthroned. This, this kind of language is all throughout the pages of Scripture. And, and let me give you a, a few, for example. Uh, 1 Kings 22, and, uh, particularly verse 19, but 1 Kings 22, perhaps you might remember this story. It's, it's Ahab wanting to take back um, Ramoth Gilead, and so he's, he's looking to create an alliance with Judah, to the south with King Jehoshaphat, and he, he comes before him and he says, let's, let's draw up an alliance, and Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat says, um, did you seek God's counsel on this? Because we don't want to just hastily rush into this and, and then get, get smoked in battle. And Ahab says, of, oh, of course, and, and so he brings out four of his prophets, who of course are, are not followers of Yahweh, and, and they're essentially yes-men to Ahab. And they prophesy, and they say, yes, you'll be successful in battle. And, and Jehoshaphat says, I, I, I'm not convinced. Where is the man of God? Consult a prophet of Yahweh. And so uh, Ahab reluctantly says, fine. Uh, he summons for the only man he knows who follows God at that time. And, and um, his name is Micaiah, the son of um, Imelah. And Ahab admits that he, that he hates Micaiah because he never prophesies good things about Ahab. And it's, it's rather kind of comical as you read this. But uh, verse 15, picking up at verse 15, let me just indulge me for a second here as we read this. When he came to the king, this is King Jehoshaphat, the, the king said to him, Micaiah, shall, shall we go up to Ramoth Gilead to battle or shall we refrain? And he answered him, go up and succeed and the Lord will give it into your hand of the king. And the king said to him, how many times must I adjure you to speak to me nothing but the truth in the name of the Lord? Um, and so he said, I, I saw all Israel scattered on the mountains like sheep with, without a shepherd. And the Lord said, these have no master. Let each of them return to their house in peace. Then Ahab said to Jehoshaphat, did I not tell you that he would not prophesy good concerning me, but rather evil? And Micaiah said, therefore, hear the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne and all the hosts of heaven standing by him on his right and on his left. God reigns actively as he resides on his throne. Micaiah was, was ultimately thrown into prison for stating this and prophesying this um, for his faithfulness and loyalty to, to God, which was driven by his view of God. His, his right perspective governed his actions. It didn't matter what king sat on what earthly throne. His allegiance was with God and to God alone, who reigned on a higher throne than King Ahab. God was ultimately in control. God was, was the authority that he submitted to. Also, you can consider Daniel in chapter 7, of course, uh, where he says, I kept looking until the thrones were set up, and the Ancient of Days took his seat, and his vesture was like the white snow, and his hair was... Um, and his head was like pure wool, his throne was ablaze in flames, and his wheels were a burning fire. A river of fire was flowing and coming out from before him. Thousands upon thousands were attending him, and myriads upon myriads of, were standing before him. The court sat, the book was opened. Then I kept looking, behold, the sound of, a bo of, of the boastful words which the horn was speaking. And I kept looking until the beast was slain, and his body was destroyed, given to the burning fire. As for the rest of the beasts, their dominion was taken away. What do we have here? We have the Ancient of Days sitting on his throne, ruling the affairs of the world, and exercising control over the greatest powers on the earth at that time, and that was the, the beast. And then all the other beasts that, that lost their dominion. God is reigning. God is ruling actively. Last but not least, and there's other texts that we could go to, but, but of course Isaiah uh, 6, which we're, we're well familiar with, and I'll just read verse 1, which says, um, in, the, in the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord sitting on his throne, 
lofty and exalted with the train of his robe filling the temple. If you read the rest of that chapter, and often we just read the first few verses as we, as we talk about Isaiah's um, um, experience and, and being confronted by God's holiness, but read the rest of that chapter and you'll see that God is actively ruling on his throne, rendering judgment in accordance to his, his will and his justice. It's fascinating. Hopefully, you, you, as, as we walk through these texts quickly, you, you noted the significance of what it, what it means for God to be sitting on his throne. This is a throne that's above all other thrones. We can often feel crushed beneath the, the pressure of this world and its alluring attractions, its temptation, its idolatry. We feel anxious over who resides perhaps in the White House or what heads of state retain their office across the land. There's one who is enthroned higher and above all. It's, it's the King of kings and the Lord of lords. When placed within the context, you can see that John was probably excited. I mean, he, he must have been excited to convey and, and write this and pass this on to the churches and the Christians of Asia Minor. And I think we too, we too wrestle with kinds of pressures such as what they experience to a degree. But we must look to the throne. We must change our perspective. Why? So we will have a, a rightly ordered view of God, which is indicative to rightful worship. Because that's what God deserves. God is worthy. Pastor Rory said it this morning. Pastor, God is worthy of all worship. Everlasting worship, which we'll talk about next week. And so we come here once a week, to worship the enthroned God who reigns above all, to reorder our perspective, to take our eyes off of earthly thrones, earthly leaders, earthly fears, earthly desires, earthly pleasures, and change our perspective to an earthly pers- or a, an, an eternal perspective. Change our earthly perspective to an eternal perspective. And for a while, we remember that there is a king who is who is and has always been a king and and will always be the king who reigns and rules. To remember that there is a God who is enthroned over all and that one day every knee will bow before that God. They'll bow before him. It's why God-centered worship is so necessary as it shapes and forms us rather than man worship and man-centered worship. We need to rightly order our perspective. This leads us to our second reason why right worship demands a change of perspective, and it's, and it's because God is preeminently enthroned. Yes, he's actively enthroned. He's working. He's reigning. But he's preeminently enthroned. And, and we, there's, there's a little bit of, of overlap that we saw from the text that we read and considered. But here in verse 3, he who was sitting was like a jasper stone and a sardius in appearance, and there was a rainbow around the throne, like an emerald in appearance. Here, John is simply describing the intrinsic majesty and the glory of, of God's throne room. And he uses imagery such as the jasper stone or the sardius or a rainbow, like an emerald in appearance. What, what's, what's going on here? What is, what is John exactly seeing? Is there symbolism here? What's, what's he conveying? Here, I think John's wording seems to be influenced by Ezekiel's vision of the Lord's throne, which is described in, in similar fashion in Ezekiel chapter 1. We don't have time to go there, um, but Ezekiel uses imagery in verses 26 through 28 that is, is similar. He uses sapphires and glowing metals and fire and radiance to describe God's throne room, to describe the preeminence of God. How could humans picture the glorious God of heaven except by, by depicting how he appears in his glory. The gemstones mentioned here are, are difficult to identify since ancient stones at that time varied in range of, of colors and, and whatnot. Um, their, their outward appearances were different and not always consistent. A jasper could refer to a, a range of colors, but it's, it's likely referring to a diamond or an orpal. If you look at Revelation 21, verse 11, he, where John uses this jasper stone again to communicate something that is crystal clear. Uh, a sardis stone is taken to mean a reddish brown or orange stone, getting its name from where it was mined from. It was mined around the, the city of Sardis, which we, we read in chapter uh, 2, I believe. 
the emerald here is, is, is um, the bright green gem that we would often be familiar with. Um, and the rainbow around the throne has, has brought about much speculation about what that exactly is. Is it, is it a halo-like rainbow because it's not multicolored? It's, it's like an emerald. There's, a, you know, there's this hue, this greenish kind of rainbow halo. But, but likely it's connected to Ezekiel's text, I think. I think this is John perhaps is drawing some of the imagery that Ezekiel used to help explain what he's seen. And, and there Ezekiel, uh, verse 28, says the rainbow like the appearance of a bow which is in the clouds on a rainy day. So I think that's what we see here, or what John was seeing, perhaps. But, but wow, just consider what he's, what he's taking in in that moment. The glorious light show that it must have been. As, as one commentator states, God's character and description lie far beyond the word pictures of mere mortals. And I think John is just doing his best to try to communicate what, he, what he's actually seeing here. How do you describe a God who's, whose passionate love is, is warmer than the hottest fire? How do, you, how do you describe a God whose purity is greater than the driven snow or whose nourishment is better than the, the best of foods or wh who's more tender than the most loving mother whose power is vastly greater than, than all the storms of the nature's most violent storms unleashed? who's more intransient than a million twinkling stars. How do you describe a God like that? Perhaps the most intriguing element of this passage is that John does not describe God's individual person, nor could, should he or could he, because we know that God is spirit. And John's readers couldn't sit down and draw a picture of God necessarily sitting on his throne. The... Of course, this avoids the possibility of image making. What John is describing is God's glory, which is consistent with what we have throughout Scripture. Found to be, this, this, is, this is certainly found to be the case in, in other parallel passages with, with regard to God's glory. And it runs parallel with, with God's condemnation of erecting images of, of, to, that represent God's being. You see, unlike pagan worship, God is to be worshipped in spirit and in truth. And the moment you erect an, an image, you, you directly or indirectly start worshipping that image. This is, this is why I think we must be careful with our use of images of that, that particularly pertain to the incarnate Son, which, of course, is much more prevalent and common today, as, as we see. Why is that? Well, because we know he, he took on flesh and dwelt among us. And, of course... Mankind is, is intrigued with that, and, 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 they, and they try to imagine what Jesus must have looked like. And, and so they craft images and, and paintings and pictures. And, and I think it's helpful to, to take caution on those and, and the use of them and, and how we think about them. And, and the late Charles Hodge, a theologian and scholar, he says this. He says, idolatry consists not only in the worship of false gods, but also in the worship of the true God by images. John is using these descriptions to simply portray the impressive value and the beauty of what they describe. Every, everything here, everything pales in comparison to God's preeminent throne and his glory and his majesty that he sees. He is preeminently enthroned. Not only is God alive and actively reigning, but he's the central focus here. He is, he is the absolute centerpiece of what is happening here in, in the universe, in, in the heavens, in his throne room. We see him preeminent in value, but also in rank. All are subject to him. We look at verse 4, and, 4 through 6. Around the throne were 24 elders, and upon the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting, uh, clothed in white garments and, and golden crowns on their heads, and out from the throne came flashes of lightning and sounds of thunder and lampstands on fire and, and seven spirits before the Lord. And, and then you have the crystal... The glass sea before the throne. <clears throat> and I'll try to explain brief here. Who, who, who are the, the 12, the 24 elders here um, that, that's surrounding the throne room, sitting on thrones? Well, two primary takes on this, and it, it goes back for centuries throughout Christian history. And some take it as the 12 tribes of, of Israel in the Old Testament and the 12 apostles in the New Testament. And they come together and it represents, you know, the, the, the whole family of God perhaps. Um, this line of thinking also suggests that the 24 is symbolic of the 24 Levitical priests from 
Um, and, and the fact that we are called um, priests as well in the New Testament. So perhaps it, it, it predicts or um, it uh, is symbolic of that. However, I believe these elders are a higher order of angels because in, in verse uh, or chapter 5, verse 9, you have the elders there singing a song saying, you were slain and purchased for God with your blood, men from every tribe. And they're not talking about themselves. They're talking about men who were purchased by the blood of Christ. In addition, angels show up everywhere throughout uh, um, apocalyptic literature, and, and they offer the, the prayers of, of God's saints to God. We don't see humans functioning in that capacity. So I think it's, I think it's angels here. There's, there's also chapter 7, verse 13 and 14, where John addresses one of the elders as my Lord. Again, you're not going to see that. You're not going to see that in first century where Christians are addressing each other as, as my Lord. Um, chapter 14, 3, Christians appear to be singing a new song here that even the elders could not understand or learn. But regardless, God's, God's throne room is set off is set off from all others, and, and with these elders surrounding God's throne and worshiping him continually, um, which we'll see in verses 10 through 11 um, next week, but they're falling down and worshiping him for his worth. The, the flashes of lightning, the sounds of great thunder only add to the grandeur, which resonate, um, really resonates back to Mount Sinai and, and the description of God's presence there in Exodus 19. The seven torches which John identifies are the, the seven spirits as um, I think, as, as we see in chapter 1, that describes the fullness of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God, God's ability to, to see all. Um, side references for that you could write down. We don't have time to go to. But Isaiah 11, 2 and Zechariah 4, 1 through 10 are, are great texts to compare to the, the lampstand and the, and the seven spirits of God there. Um, this idea, I think, thus underscores the description of the sea of glass before the throne, since first century readers um, would not have understood glass the way we see glass today. Um, they didn't have the technology to make glass clear and transparent and see-through. But rather, I think it's, it's better to understand this as a dazzling um, sea of crystal, sparkling. Um, as one commentator, I think, summarizes it well. He says, heaven is not a shadowy world of mist and ghost-like imagery. It, it's a world of dazzling, brilliant light, refracting and shining as through jewels and crystal in a manner beyond our ability to describe or imagine. This is, this is incredible to, to consider what John must have seen and how it must have just overwhelmed his senses to see all that was going on with the light and the beauty and the majesty of the, of the King of Kings. God's majestic glory is beyond our comprehension. And I think it's why the psalmist says, it's just too wonderful for me. How can I attain it? I cannot. And so we're left saying, what an incredible God we believe and serve. And so order, order your perspective, order our perspective according to who God is rather than allowing our current circumstances to define it. And when you do, a rightful response of worship will overflow in a heart of praise and communion that does not stop when you leave these doors today. Part of our problem, I think, is that we simply just think too little about God or of God. And John's text here, John's vision, I think, will help us enhance our, our ability to, to think better, to think more deeply about God and who he is. Why, why is all this important? Well, because I think it helps us, again, as I've mentioned over and over, it reorients our perspective of who God is. He is actively and faithfully reigning from his throne. He is preeminently exalted and enthroned in all his glory. And our view of God, really, it, it affects everything. It affects our worship, ultimately. A right perspective ought to humble us to the point of regular confession. As we see God in his pure majesty and holiness, it ought to deepen our dependence on him and strengthen our confidence in him as we see his preeminence as the one who reigns above all other kings and Caesars. We can trust him. We can hope in him. We can persevere because of him. 
And when we do, the, the communion that follows is sweet and right as God intends. It's why we regularly come before the table to obediently remember the sacrifice of Christ that made the union of God and man possible. This passage of Revelation 4 reminds us of the glories of heaven that Christ set aside to take on flesh and dwell among us and to die for us. Why? That, that, that we might know the joy of enjoying God for all eternity with, with rightful worship that is due him.